I don't know if y'all still have your bulletins, but in there there's an outline. And um, just as kind of a preparation, the title is Christ Glorified in Our Reconciliation and Perseverance. Um, and actually this is going to be split up into two parts. So the second part will be a month from now. So the perseverance aspect of this we won't get to tonight. Uh, the plan tonight is to focus on Christ glorified in our reconciliation, which is the already. Um, in perseverance, there's the already, and then there's the not yet. And those are uh, not to be separated, but we're going to look at one at a time. Um, separated in our thoughts. Um, So uh, if you if y'all just think back, you don't have to look right here, but if you think back, do y'all remember, um, well, I would like to say that I, this is my first time up here, and I, I have a different speech than a lot of people around here, so please try to look beyond that and, and hear uh, faithfully to God. Um, um, sometimes I, I feel like uh, Peter at the, the fire, and people are like, your speech betrays you, you know. But um, <laughs> so, but um, okay. Um, after Adam had sinned, Adam and Eve, the Lord said, "I will put enmity between you and the woman." And then, if you look in Revelation twenty-one, this is the the furthest not yet that that's coming. This is the ultimate peace that God is going to bring. And I wanted to call it to your memory. Um, in chapter 21, verse 1, Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no more sea. Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself will be them, with them and be their God. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, no, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. And then if you look in verse 24, and the nations of those who are saved shall walk in its light, and the kings of the earth bring their glory and honor into it. it its gates shall not be shut at all by day, there shall be no night there, and they shall bring the glory and honor of the nations into it. But there shall by no means enter it, enter it anything that defiles or causes an abomination or a lie, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. So uh, the reason why I read that tonight, if you'll turn to Colossians, I'll read tonight's uh, text and then we'll uh, proceed. Uh, chapter 1, verse 21 through 23. And you who once were alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now he is reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and blameless and above reproach in his sight if indeed you continue in the faith grounded and steadfast and are not moved away from the hope of the gospel which you heard, which was preached to every creature under heaven of which I, Paul, became a minister. Reconciliation is the focus and the response should be assurance of the salvation that God has, has um, ushered in for you if you are uh, a repentant believer in Christ if you've been born again to be bold in your assurance um, and if you think about it this text talks about it as a past tense and you look ahead to where we read in Revelation where we're going um, there's aspects of God's salvation that are finished but there's much more to come so um, I want to uh, hopefully from this text encourage you and honor Christ by talking about 
uh, the already aspect of this peace that God has brought. Okay, so Colossians is um, written. Uh, let me get my notes here. It's, it was written um, to do a, a few things. There were some problems going in Colossae that were affecting um, their understanding of, of how to live the Christian life, even affecting the gospel in certain ways. And um, different men have different takes on what the problem actually was. You know, was it external? Was it internal? Um, but the issue was, I believe it was within the church, because if you look in chapter 2, verse 18, it says, Let no one cheat you of your reward, taking delight in false humility and worship of angels, intruding into those things which he has not seen, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind. It's, it's personal. It, 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 you, when you read the problems, it seems like um, it, it's a little intimate in the church. And he's talking about a person or persons. Um, so based on that, and there's also, it, people say it was Gnosticism, but with new understanding of Gnosticism, there's no um, indication that one of Gnosticism's major tenets is in this, and that is that there is no con, uh, discussion on matter being evil in this book. So, um, so the problem, what is it? I think it helps to know what the problem is. Um, it's likely a local folk belief tendency uh, to call on angels for help and protection from evil spirits, attested by many inscriptions in ancient documents. There was one a magical stone amulet that was found in that area, it was, and it said, uh, Michael, Gabriel, Oreo, Raphael, protect the one who wears this. Flee, O oh hated one, Solomon pursues you. Um, so, if it is a person, it's likely a religious, uh, spiritual guide that has come up within the church, and he's presenting himself that way. But he's led by a sensuous mind, which we read in um, verse 18, his fleshly mind. And he probably claimed to have a superior insight into the spiritual realm. He probably was advising Christians to practice, practice certain rites taboos and rituals as a means of protection from evil spirits and deliverance from afflictions. There's also Judaistic teaching in here. Um, if you look in verse 11, you know, in him you are also circumcised with a circumcision made without hands. And then if you go down to 16, so let no one judge you in food or in drink regarding a festival, a new moon, a Sabbath. It's clearly Jewish. Um, so with these mixture of, of these errors um, and the way that it was influencing the people, um, Epaphras, who was actually likely the founder of the church, it wasn't Paul, because this church was about, um, about 100 miles from Ephesus. And um, it's a small town. It used to be thriving, got small when, when Paul was preaching in Ephesus and on his missionary journey, he was in Ephesus. And um, while he was there, if you look in the Acts, he preached there for over two years. And it's likely during that time, Epaphras visited of Ephesus, got converted, God saved him, and he returned home and preached the gospel in Colossae, which was actually kind of a small area small town, and then many, multiple people got saved, Jewish, Jew, Jews and Gentiles. And then this problem comes up with the local folk belief in this spiritual guide. So Epaphras um, is uh, distraught, you know, like um, there's nothing more um, discouraging, I guess, a temptation to be discouraged when you see people falling away or people being influenced by error. Um, and he, being grieved or being very much concerned but unequipped to handle it, went all the way to Rome where Paul was in prison because he wanted um, help or revelation on how to handle this. And if you look in Philemon, um, 
chapter, or verse 23, Epaphras, my fellow prisoner. So Epaphras likely got imprisoned when he was there. And then what Paul did, wrote this letter and sent it back to Colossae, along with Philemon, the letter of Philemon, and along with um, uh, um, Ephesians, and uh, he sent someone else with uh, Philippians. Okay, so knowing that, the focus of this letter is on Christ. It's focusing on him being all in all, him being supreme, and him being uh, um, in the believer by union. Um, this, these teachings, this man, or, or this, the, it was going on in the church was devaluing Christ. So Paul writes this letter to bring them to the remembrance of who Christ is and that he is all you need. Okay, immediate context. I have to go quicker here. I'm killing a lot of my time, our time, sorry. Um, if you look in uh, chapter one, verse 15, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation, for by him all things were created. This is talking about the son of his love that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things and in him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he may have the preeminence. So he is supreme over creation, in verse 15, and he's supreme over the church, almost like the recreation. And it's because for the purpose that he might have the preeminence, the superiority, the supremacy over all things. In verse 19, for it pleased the Father that in him all the fullness should dwell. That's the Godhead. That's all the fullness of God should dwell in the body that Christ united to himself. And by him to reconcile all things to himself by him. So this is the Father reconciling all things to himself by Jesus Christ, whether things on earth or things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of his cross. So we have this hymn and we have this attachment to the hymn that Christ is to be supreme over all, that that's our purpose, that's, that's where we're going um, in, in the glorification. But then if for this letter, for the Colossians who are having this very teachings and they're, they're confused about how to live the Christian life, they're confused about um, these angels that they're wondering, do we call for them to get help for our, our problems? How are we protected? Um, and in verse 21, Paul is reminding them that this work that Christ has done and will do has already begun with you. He gets personal. He says, and you who once were alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now he is reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy, blameless, and above reproach in his sight. So now you have a, a bit of the, the context. The first point is, or I would say the main point of all this is Christ is glorified when we, God's former enemies, are assured of our peace with him and persevere. Christ is glorified when we, God's former enemies, are assured of our peace with him and persevere. Point one, remember you were a stranger and an enemy before your conversion. You can see that in verse 21. And now you who once were alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now he is reconciled. Well, that's not even a sentence or an independent statement. It's, it's, it's actually linked to the main verb, which is reconciled. And the point is, is it's, the, it's the object of the subject. God reconciles you. So in English, that would come at the end of a sentence, but Paul's putting it at the beginning so that you will remember, so that we will remember that we were once wicked 
and strangers. Um, if you look, um, if you remember in Ezekiel 36, um, God said in the new covenant that in the many promises that he was going to fulfill, one of those is that he said, you will remember your wicked ways and you will loathe yourselves in your own sight. Um, and I don't do this for your sake alone. It's for God's glory. And the emphasis isn't on our wickedness here, or even, even though that's brought out in the text. This is like, kind of like a black canvas where you can see the bright star of God. It's giving a background to um, show the contrast of the glory of God in our reconciliation. Look who he reconciled. Look who it is that God is reconciling to himself. And um, if you will look um, in uh, Psalm 58. Actually, I'm sorry, we don't have time. So if you'll go to just Matthew 5. Since the original sin, sin that um, has come to us through our, by nature... And since the, the guilt of Adam's sin that has been imputed or credited to us all, um, we are born godless. We're born idolaters and we're born strangers of God. We're born um, aliens. We don't belong with God. We don't want to have anything to do with God. And if uh, I want to demonstrate something... Um, if you look in Matthew 5, verse 23. Therefore, if you bring your gift to the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go your way. First, be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. So we have reconciliation here. But well, what's the point of why, why am I going here? Well, think about this case. If I'm at the altar and I'm going to go pray, and God says, if you remember that your brother has something against you, you don't just change your attitude and keep giving your gift. There's something between you. You need to go deal with that. Be reconciled to him, then give your gift. And what that, what that teaches is with the, the, the offense, there's a wall. There's a ground for this separation that has occurred. And it's the same way with us, with God. There is something between us and God. We're separated. And uh, we're aliens because of that separation. Um, we're also enemies. Actually, the estrangement is because we're at enmity. The, the problem between us and God is the hatred. And the en enmity is not just from us. God is righteous and just, and his enmity was towards us. Um, and also something that's not brought out, if you go back to Colossians, in the, in the, in the English, is the fact that Paul says, um, really I should say the Spirit of God says about us, that um, you were alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works. Well, what's not brought out there is the continuous aspect of this. I noticed that when we, that's the way I used to think. I remember being lost. I just thought I had, had done some bad things and I, and I needed to do a little bit better. And you know that when you evangelize to people. They all think that, oh yeah, there's some bad things and I hope I get to heaven. Uh, our thinking about our sin and about who God is is uh, completely deceived. Um, we continuously, continuously lived in our sin. We, went, we didn't have a break. Um, in Proverbs 21, it says even the plowing of the wicked, even the plowing is sin. So you're at work. You remember this when you're lost? And you're sinning. You, your motivations for work, you're grumbling, you have no desire to honor Christ, you have no thankfulness. 
um, that's the way we were in our minds. We always, we, you know, like a picture a guy who wakes up and he's just un, uh, uh, somewhat bitter because he has to get up early. He, he thinks because he's proud with his sinful nature that he shouldn't have to um, get up so early. I can't wait for Friday so that I can get up late on Saturday. Um, everything we did in our mind, and, and it's proven by our works. Um, in other words, remember. Remember who you once were. Remember how dark and how continuously dark you were. How much you love sin. Remember who it was that, that, that um, came to save you. Remember that you and I, we would never have turned to Christ. Never. We would have never turned from those things we were en ensnared to. And honor God now and honor Christ now by being thankful and rejoice. Rejoice with full assurance God has reconciled you by his son's death. Remember, Christ is glorified when we, God's former enemies, are assured of our peace with him and perseverance. So if you move on to 22, I'm sorry, 21b, yet now he is reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and blameless and above reproach in his sight. Um, if you'll notice, it says once and now, in verse 21, once. So he's pointing out the past and, and the B, yet now he is reconciled. Um, with the amount of time we have left, um, I want to talk about reconciliation. Um, it's a change of status with God. And the only way that status can change is if you um, have the enmity dealt with, that wall that was between you and God, it must have been dealt with. And it's been dealt with in Christ. Um, actually, this word reconciled is the strongest form of it. It's a compound. It actually focuses on you have been reconciled from, it's emphasizing from that to this. Um, and everywhere in the Bible you see reconciled, it's always past tense. This is one of those things. There's salvation, that we're saved now, but yet we're yet to be saved. We're, um, we're actually have to receive more forgiveness, you know? Um, we have to, if for me to say that I'm, I'm forgiven and I don't have to ask for forgiveness anymore is, um, means I'm still in my darkness, or still in darkness. Um, but reconciliation is so close to justification. It's one of those things the Bible talks about is done because of Christ. The, the status with God has gone from enemy to friend and he's done it. It says he reconciled you. This is to his glory. He is doing this so that he might have the preeminence, so that he might be supreme over you, so that he might have his glory in um, having you uh, serve and be with him as we saw in Revelation 21. Um, if you'll turn to Isaiah 53. How has this reconciliation come about? In the body of his flesh through death. Um, in verse 4. There's so many aspects to salvation to talk about, to, to explain reconciliation uh, accurately, but we only have time to focus on this aspect, the fact that Christ was uh, the one that, that came voluntarily, this, the 
out of the, the beloved Son of God voluntarily came. It was the will of the Father that he come and he came voluntarily to take upon that, that sin and to suffer that we might be made peace with God. Verse four, when he was on the cross, it, it, it says, surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. We didn't, even, we didn't even understand why he was on the cross till God revealed that to us. We thought that he was, like Paul, we thought he was a curse because of his own sin. That's the way the people, that's the way Paul thought. But in verse five, but that's not true. Jesus Christ is God and man and he was on the cross not for his own sins, for he had never sinned. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him. And by his stripes, we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray, estrangement. From birth, he went astray. And the only way that you could have peace is with his chastisement. We turned everyone to his own way and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. The reason why you should rejoice and have full assurance is because of the person of Christ. He is God. And when God stood that day and took your judgment upon himself, it was worthy. It was satisfactory. And the application of this work of Christ comes in time for each believer by the work of God's spirit. And if you're sitting here tonight and you know that you were a former enemy and you're not the same way that you were, you're not his enemy anymore, that you're reconciled, if you know that about yourself, then you should be rejoicing. You should be praising God and you should have full assurance. You should be bold in your prayer because of the reconciliation that God has um, paid for, that he has dealt with. Um, if you look at Hebrews chapter 10, Uh, verse 19. Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiness, holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he consecrated for us through the veil, that is his flesh, and having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith. Believe. Continue to believe. Remember the cross. Remember Isaiah 53. Let that go through your mind that your, the chastisement for your peace was laid on him. Let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water that came from the work of the Spirit through the gospel. Um, so take the exhortation tonight, take the encouragement. Um, God doesn't want or desire that you persevere with doubt. God doesn't want you to live under doubtful fears in order to persevere. God wants you to be fully assured and bold no, in faith, not in your own strength, but in faith in Christ knowing that his work 
is worthy of your assurance. His work is worthy of your, um, your boldness. Rejoice with full assurance God has reconciled you by his son's death. Let's pray. Oh Lord God, Father in heaven, we praise you and thank you, Lord. Um, our lives, Lord, knowing how weak we are, are yours. We know that we are in union with you and you have reconciled us to yourself that no longer are we who believe, Lord, who have been born again, our enemies. You call us friends, not because of who we are or what we've done, but because of your Son, because of your will, your election, and, and sending him that we might be saved by his blood. And we praise you, Lord, and I pray for this congregation. Lord, I pray for our brothers and sisters that we each would be bold this week to preach your gospel, that we would have full assurance of the, the peace that you have bought, and that we would be bold in our prayers and uh, be assured of your salvation, bringing glory to your name. Uh, like Abraham, when people see us, Lord, um, in, in our uh, trials and being bold, they will um, be forced to look at you because, because of the faith you've given us. They'll be forced to say that that boldness doesn't come from man. It, it, it comes from you, O oh Lord. I pray this, Lord, for your glory. Amen.